tea uh, was originally discovered, as legend has it, uh, in China around about 5,000 years ago by Emperor Shen Nung, who was a renowned herbalist. He used to like drinking herbal infusion for a health benefit. And one day, again, as legend has it, so believe this or not, he was sitting underneath a tree and brewing up some hot water to make some form of herbal infusion to drink. And a leaf from the tree fell into the water and he thought, give it a go. So uh, he plucked more of the leaves and then boiled um, those up with the water and drank the liquid that came from that and immediately felt refreshed and revived and thought, wow, it's amazing, it tastes great and it's making me feel great, uh, everyone should be drinking this. And he happened to be sitting underneath what we now know to be a Camellia sinensis tree. Camellia sinensis is part of the Camellia family of plants and that is tea. So Camellia sinensis is tea. All tea, unless it's herbal infusions, so some of the ones here which are herbal infusions not actually tea. So green tea, black tea, anything that is tea comes from one plant. And it's not different plants, it's one type of plant. But it's how you process that that will change it from different characteristics. And again, you'll learn that shortly. But there he was, 5,000 years ago, trying to uh, tell everyone to be drinking tea. And the tea um, trees at that point would have been around about, so well, um, as tall as this building here, because they will grow that tall. Uh, and to get the very best tea, you want to be plucking the youngest shoots and buds, the, the youngest growth on the top of the, top of the trees. And that's very difficult to get to um, because you don't want to be climbing up the trees. So 5,000 years ago, when they first started plucking tea, they used to do it by monkeys. So they'd train the monkeys to go up to the top of the tree and pluck the leaves and throw them down, and then they'd collect up the leaf. You think I'm joking, I'm not joking. Um, and so they collect it up and they'll make the tea from that. Still today, actually, in the Yellow Mountains in China, you can get monkey pit tea where they're still training the monkeys. The thing is, though, that as tea became more and more popular, there clearly weren't enough monkeys in the world to be able to pluck the tea, and quite frankly, they weren't very good at it. So um, they started pruning the bushes down to waist height to make it easy to pluck by hand. So the tea bush would grow to as tall as this building, if you allowed it to, but by brewing uh, by um, pushing it down and chopping it down to about waist height, it's easy to pluck by hand. And still today, nearly 5,000 years later, 95-96% uh, of all tea drunk in the world has been plucked by hand the same way as it would have been done 5,000 years ago. Um, so a very, very traditional way of doing it. So that was in China 5,000 years ago, uh, and China had a monopoly on tea for actually several thousand years. And it wasn't until uh, just over a thousand years ago we started seeing tea being drunk in other parts of the world. And the first place in the world it would have been drunk would have been Japan. And then it started going other parts of the, the Far East. And then it wasn't until around about the 1660s, well actually the 1640s, that tea was first drunk in Europe. And contrary to popular belief, it wasn't the British who were the first to be drinking tea in Europe. It was actually the Dutch. And the reason why the Dutch were drinking tea um, uh, sooner than the English and the British was that all tea that came from China at the time had to come through one company in, uh, in Holland. So the Dutch East Indies Company had a monopoly on all trade with China. And so anything that was coming from China had to come through one company. Uh, and they actually had a monopoly on that for over 100 years. So much so that actually everything that came into Europe from China was coming through one company. And so they, the Dutch were the first to be drinking tea around about the 1640s in, in Europe. And it wasn't until the 1660s that you started seeing tea being drunk in England. But the British straight away had a thirst for it. And so started drinking more and more. But it was very expensive. Very expensive because it was coming all the way from China. Also very expensive because the Dutch East Indies Company wanted to make a bit of money out of it as well. And thirdly, it was very expensive because the, the British government taxed it very heavily. So the duty on tea was uh, about 110%. So it was uh, a huge amount of duty on tea because the government wanted to make some money as well. So it was only really the rich and famous who could afford to drink tea. And that led rise to smuggling. So tea smuggling in, uh, in Britain was big, big business because um, if you could smuggle it in, you didn't have to pay the duty on it, you could basically double your money, you made more money. And the smugglers, who weren't really the sort of, the, you know, they, were, they, were, they weren't the most reputable type of people, so they used to blend the tea with other things as well to make it go even further. So they used to blend it together with um, all sorts of lovely things, including sheep's dung. Okay, so sheep poo. Uh, and they used to blend it together to make it go a bit further. And at the time, the teas coming from uh, China would have had a kind of like an earthy character to them. They thought, ah, sheep's poo, a bit earthy. Let's put it all in together. They used to blend it together and it used to go a lot further and then they didn't pay the duty on it, they didn't pay the tax on it, so the smugglers were making an awful lot of money. And it's thought at uh, certain points in history, anything up to 50%, 100% of 
half of the tea coming into the UK had been smuggled in. And this is a massive issue for the government because they weren't making their money from it. So in the middle of the uh, 18th century, uh, the tax, taxes on tea were cut down to 12.5%. So um, that meant that all of a sudden, smuggling was no longer profitable. So the cost came right down, smuggling stopped, so therefore no more sheep's done, no more sheep's poo in there, which meant that the quality went up again, and all of a sudden more people started drinking tea. And so uh, ironically, within a very short space of time, the British government were making significantly more money out of uh, the, the taxes on tea than they had been when they were charging significantly more. And so popularity increased. And then going into sort of the middle of the, uh, or beginning in the middle of the uh, 19th century, as uh, the British Empire grew and uh, colonisation of other countries happened, uh, the British then stole some tea bushes and took those tea bushes to the places that they had newly colonised, notably, notably uh, in India. So they stole some bushes from China and said, right, okay, now let's, let's start producing our own tea. We don't want to be buying it through China anymore, let's do it ourselves. So they took the tea bushes from China, took them to North India and said, okay, uh, you're going to start making tea for us now, for the British back, uh, back in England. Uh, back in Britain, and, uh, and people in India are okay, fine, well, what, what's tea? And they said, well, it's this bush here. And they said, well, we've got it here already. And they'd had it growing naturally in India for nearly 5,000 years and never drunk it like tea. Whereas just the north of the Himalayas in China, it had been growing and had been cultivated and had been drunk like tea for nearly 5,000 years prior to uh, the uh, people in India drinking it. But it was growing naturally there anyway. So all of a sudden it meant that it would grow there and they could cultivate it and then um, expand the, um, the growth of tea there so that um, more and more tea could be produced uh, for to be shipped back to Britain and other parts of the world as well. And as the, as the British colonised other parts of uh, South Asia and then latterly East Africa, uh, more and more tea was then uh, produced in those countries and that was the start of the tea industry changing from just purely being from the Far East and then it was being from South Asia, so India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, places like that, Bangladesh too, and then latterly in East Africa, so Kenya, Uganda, um, Tanzania, places like that as well, started to produce tea for the British um, population. And that carried on, and so popularity increased, uh, costs came down, more and more people started drinking it, and then, uh, and then we saw, um, again, at the end of the um, First World War, popularity increased dramatically because tea by that point, people thought, well, tea is part of British society, everyone's got to be drinking tea. Uh, and then it was rationed after the First World War, which meant that everyone got the chance to have a little bit of tea every single week and they were able to drink it. And then in the 1950s, um, the tea bag was first um, commercially available, so people started drinking tea bags. But at the time, people thought it was just a load of rubbish that was going into tea bags and they wouldn't catch on, no one would want to drink tea bags. Uh, but they were quite wrong because from a standing start in 1950 of zero <coughs> tea being drunk in tea bags, to at its height, uh, most popular about 10 years ago, where um, nearly 96% of all tea in the UK being drunk in tea bag form. Clearly, the British, as a as a nation, were um, drinking a lot of tea bag type tea. Um, that said, over the last 10 years, things have switched back again, and people are starting to drink more and more loose leaf tea as people travel the world a lot more, see tea being drunk elsewhere in the world, and want to um, mimic that back home, uh, back in, in the UK. And so we'll start um, setting up little tea companies and start bringing in teas from all over the world. And certainly the type of teas that you can buy in a supermarket today or indeed even here or, or that you may have at home will be much wider selection than you would have been able to buy um, even in sort of five or so years ago. And so there's been a real resurgence in tea and more and more people want to be drinking tea. Coffee, clearly that's big business too. And I know that you sell a lot of coffee here too. Um, but uh, where people maybe sort of 10 or 15 years ago were, were going out for coffee and where coffee was really um, became more and more important, tea wasn't quite so interesting for consumers at that point. That said, what's happening now is that more and more people are starting to realise there's more to tea than just dead leaves. <coughs> there. And therefore, um, people are demanding to drink more and more um, different types of teas and different styles of tea and asking more questions about it. And uh, as a result, tea is having a real um, renaissance, a real resurgence, and more and more people are drinking different and better quality teas as well. So your sort of your classic um, Tetley, PG Tips, um, Taifu, companies like that who uh, traditionally have been the biggest companies in the UK for selling tea, their numbers are declining every single year. They're getting smaller and smaller as, a, um, uh, as companies because people are starting to drink better and better quality tea and they just don't have the best quality tea. It's not the worst tea in the world, but it's not certainly not the best tea in the world. And so people are just demanding more out of tea. 
and certainly some of the questions that you may get asked by some of your customers as well will be uh, maybe a little bit um, different. For those of you who've been working in the sort of uh, cafe um, industry for a while, will be quite different perhaps today than they were even a couple of years ago. Okay, so that brings us right up to present day. So I sort of skipped through a few bits of history there, but just sort of giving you a sort of a snapshot. But basically, tea has been around for 5,000 years, and in terms of its manufacturing process, hasn't really changed very much in that 5,000 years. <coughs> Uh, which makes it a very, very traditional beverage. More and more countries are starting to produce tea as they realise that actually there's more, that more people wanting to drink better quality teas and interesting teas. And tea will generally grow where it's warm and wet. So usually between the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer, if you know, if you think about the globe, sort of the middle part of the, uh, the earth where it tends to be a bit warmer and a bit wetter, uh, and that's where tea grows best. And then I, I use the analogy of wine when it comes to tea because People don't think of tea as being quite similar to wine in some respect, but when I explain it, you'll understand why I'm using that. So with, with wine, people know when you get, you get good years in wines. We go, oh, that was a great year, yeah, 1976, what a fantastic year for wine. Uh, and then they go, oh, that was a poor year, yeah, 97, that was a really bad year for wine. And, and people kind of get that with wine, whereas with tea, people don't really think that it has the same effects there. But in tea, because it's a natural product that's been grown in, you know, um, on, in areas of land in different parts of the world, you get good years and bad years in tea as well. Uh, it's just the wine industry tends to be a little bit more posh than the tea industry, and they have posh words for this kind of thing. But with tea, you do get good years and bad years. So certain tea estates may produce fantastic quality tea one year, and then not such great quality um, uh, the year after. And so that's where, when it comes to uh, blending teas, we have to be sure that where we're sourcing our teas from uh, have consistent quality. We may buy, buy from different parts of the world, uh, each year to try and keep that same quality um, coming through. So you get good years and bad years in tea, but also um, hopefully you'll, you'll get different types of tea coming from different parts of the world as well. Right, so let's recap. So we start off with the tea coming from the, the estate where they're, they're plucking it. Then they're taking it to a factory where it sits and it's withering for about a day, where it's, it's just sitting there, it's got no, no water in there and therefore it's starting to wilt and droop. And then it's either rolled or it's chopped up. Then it's allowed to sit there for a further hour, changing colour from the natural green colour to the dark brown or black colour. And then you put it in the oven and cook it for about 20 minutes. And then it'll go through the sieves and it'll be sorted out to the different shapes and sizes. That whole process from bush to cup takes around about 24 hours. And all that's happening during that time is basically the tea is mostly just sitting around and it's being dried and shaped in a fancy way. So nothing's added into it, and the only thing that's taken away is moisture. So that whole process there takes about a, a, a day. What I've explained there is black tea. Tea that you would um, drink as an English breakfast or something which you drink with milk in it here in the UK um, specifically. That said, if you want to make green tea, you just miss out one stage of that process. So when people think that green tea and black tea are completely different, Actually, that's not the truth at all. The only difference between green tea and black tea is one hour in its processing. So remember that middle bit, like the apple where it changes colour. If you want it to be a green tea, you don't let it sit there for an hour. If you want it to be a black tea, you let it sit there for an hour, changing colour. That's the only difference between green tea and black tea. So most people will say, oh, I drink green tea because it's better for my health. And most people go, oh, I don't like the taste of it, therefore it must be doing me even more good. But the point is that it's actually, there's no difference, it's the same plant and it's just purely the difference in it changing colour for an hour like the apple would, okay? So a green tea isn't allowed to change colour and a black tea is allowed to change colour, one hour, that's it, okay? So uh, there are your two classic styles of tea, green tea and black tea. However, you also have a white tea. You don't have a white tea in your range, but uh, a white tea would be uh, one stage earlier in the processing where a, a, a true white tea, such as this one here, is just tea leaves that have been plucked and just air-dried. So that's a um, very, very simple way of making tea. It generally will be a very, very high grade of tea. Uh, and even though there's less processing, it's just plucked and dried and that's it. It tends to be a bit more expensive because of the nature of how they're drying it and things like that too. So that's a white tea. Then you have a, a green tea, as I've just explained, which has been rolled and then, then uh, heated to stop it from going to becoming a black tea. And then in between a green tea and a black tea, you have a blue tea. 
otherwise known as oolong, which is what you sell here. So you have an oolong tea, and that's halfway between a green tea and a black tea. So who can guess what's happened to it? Thank you. Uh, so about half an hour of that change of colour. Okay. So uh, and if you look at the actual uh, leaf, the uh, oolong here. Now, when you look at your, your oolong, you're looking at it and you think, yeah, it's green. But actually, if you look closer to it, it's got that kind of bluish kind of colour there to it. And that's where it gets its name, blue tea, or oolong tea. Okay? So you see it's green, but it's also got sort of the darker bits, and it's a little bit, little bit blue in colour. Okay? So you can see that, that's where it gets its name, blue tea. But most people in the UK will, will refer to it as oolong and not blue tea. But elsewhere in the world, it could be known as uh, blue tea. So to colour coordinate things, you've got a, a white tea, a green tea, a blue or oolong tea, and then a black tea. You also do have other types of tea as well. You have a yellow tea, which is somewhere between a white tea and a black tea, just to confuse you, don't worry, it's very, very rare. And you also have, um, uh, if you go to China, you have something called Pu'er. Has anyone ever heard of Pu'er? You've heard of it? Yeah, I've seen the supermarket, but I've never tried it. Okay, so Pu'er um, is a tea that's been aged whereby it's been buried in a cave for many, many years. And so it picks up, once it's been made as a normal tea, it's then put into a cave, uh, and it's buried for um, anywhere between uh, one and a half years and a hundred years, okay? You need to store tea very carefully. When you're, when you're brewing your tea here, you must always put the jar lid back down and, and keep it as uh, airtight as possible for as long as possible. But when it comes to pu'er tea, it basically, the idea is that it, it's picking up moisture and bacteria and mold and it becomes a really, really mouldy old tea. And in China, they pay an awful lot of money for that type of tea. Uh, but in my personal opinion, I think the name Pu Er is very, very apt, okay? Because the older it is, the more it does taste like food, okay? Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Now, although it doesn't have that in there, it may have a bit of back poo in there, I don't know, but, um, uh, but basically, the older it gets, the more horrible it tastes as far as I'm concerned, but then the more valuable it gets as far as the Chinese are concerned. Anyway, that's a very, very specialist type of tea, but they're sort of really classic size. But to, on its own is a green tea and a black tea and a oolong tea are sort of your core, core ones, and a white tea would be something which would be uh, quite specialist and generally a bit more expensive as well. Okay, so that's, that's uh, tea in its own, uh, tea there, in terms of how it's uh, produced, how it's grown and all that too. What I'm going to do now is get you to basically taste all this tea. So a wine taster would uh, purse their lips a little bit and then would uh, suck up a bit of the, the wine and make a bit of a noise there and that helps them with the taste and the flavour. However, when it comes to tea tasting, tea tasters are not as posh as wine tasters again, okay? So tea tasters do it a little bit differently, okay? So how a tea taster would do it uh, would be using this type of crockery here. So uh, as James just put the, this in here, basically you put the tea leaves in, uh, you then put the hot water in there, uh, then you put the lid on. And then after a period of time, you see here on the uh, on this uh, mug here, it's got sort of teeth edge front here. So it's not like a normal mug, it's got that little bit there. And by putting the lid on it then, it basically means that uh, when you tip this up, the, that, those teeth there will strain the tea leaves, and will, the tea leaves will remain in here, and the liquid that comes out will be the tea. I'll let that brew just for a couple of minutes longer. Um, but basically, what would happen then, is you tip it into a bowl here, and as a tea taster, there's three things I'll be looking at. I'll be looking at the, the leaf, as in the leaf that you have in the jar there, the dry leaf. That'll tell me something about the quality of the tea. The next thing I'll be looking at is the wet leaf, what's left in there. That'll also tell me something about the quality of the tea. I may even have a smell of that and have a sniff of it to see what it tastes and smells like too. And then thirdly, what's in here, the liquid in here, known as the liquor, and that is what I'll be looking at as well. That'll tell me something again about the quality of the tea but then I'll have a taste of that. Okay, so this one here probably hasn't brewed for quite long enough, but I'm going to pour it out in the next time. So you see here, I'm straining it, so no tea is falling out there, but the liquid's coming through. And you can basically just wedge it like that, and then carry on straining there. So this is professional tea tasters crockery. It should be either a silver plated spoon or a gold plated one, because the metal there will be uh, inert and you won't get any taste from the metal. Unfortunately, I've used this spoon probably close to 1.5 million times now, and as a result, if you look closely, the silver, yeah. I've, I've slurped the silver off, okay, so I've got silver left in there. 
it's my spoon that I was, I was given in my first year of technique, um, and it's my, my precious spoon, so I'm a bit of a careful about it, so I can't lose it. But it does have my name on it, so it's okay. Um, what I want to do is dump the spoon in, and have a bit of a slurp. By slurp, I do mean slurp, so have a, have a listen to this. Okay? So you want to have a bit of a slurp there, so, so the more noise you make, the better. And the reason why I'm making noise um, is I want to basically help with the oxygen and the flavour. Yeah. Okay, so basically uh, the slurping process is really, really important. So by slurping you basically want to um, get as much oxygen in, in your mouth as possible because oxygen will help with taste and flavour. Uh, <laughs> a little bit. Um, and then oxygen will help with taste and flavour. You're also spraying it all over your tongue at the same time. So that all your taste buds in your tongue are suddenly going to be aligned with the flavour of the tea. And thirdly, and most importantly, by slurping it like that, you're actually getting all the aroma and the smell of it going up into your, your nose, into your olfactory senses. And by doing that, you're actually getting the smell of the tea at the same time as the taste. So if you've ever held your nose, or had a blocked up nose and you can't uh, you find it difficult to, uh, to taste it, it's because you're blocking your sense of smell. So your sense of smell is more important to taste than your tongue is. So by slurping and making lots of noise, you're getting all those senses working at the same time and together, which means that you're actually getting more flavour coming through. So what I want you to be doing when you're tasting all of these teas is to be making quite a bit of noise.